J. Stongo, Sarah Barnett, Jaho Jifkados, Muskogee Owes, Talakwa Legados. My name is Sarah Barnett. I'm a citizen of the Muskogee Nation. I am streaming from Talakwa, Oklahoma, and I have the honor of serving as the director of the Center for Tribal Studies and chair of the American Indian Heritage Committee, who's responsible for planning the annual symposium on the American Indian. I am so happy to be able to join you today and to introduce our first keynote speaker for this week's events. And I wanna welcome you um, to this session. Whether you're joining us from Zoom or joining us on Facebook, we hope that you will um, take the time to enter in your questions throughout the presentation using the chat feature or the comment feature. And we'll try to get to as many of those as we can by the end of the session. This session is titled A Million Lines of Code, The Future of News and Jobs in Indian Country with our keynote presenter, Mark Trahan, who's Shoshone Bannock and editor of Indian Country Today. As you probably know, this session is one of many that are included in this year's virtual agenda. All the sessions are being recorded. Um, of course, you'll be able to go back and watch this one at any time since it's on our Facebook page. And I wanna point out that this session is sponsored by the Oklahoma Humanities Council. And we want to just show our thanks to them for their sponsorship and continued support for the symposium. Mark Trahan is editor of Indian Country Today. He's known for his election reporting in Indian Country, developing the first comprehensive database of American Indians and Alaska Natives running for office. His research has been cited in publications ranging from the New York Times to The Economist, and most recently in Teen Vogue. <laughs> So I am going to turn it over to Mr. Trahant now, and um, again, we'll get to the Q&A at the end of the session. Thank you, Sarah, and thank you so much for uh, having me here today. I really wish I was there in person. I was really looking forward to this. And it's funny, when we first started um, talking about this um, event, uh, it, talking about Indian country today is something I could always do, and I was excited to do it. But since then, uh, so many things have happened that the story has actually become more significant. And I uh, hope to be able to get into that a little bit today. So let me start with some background. No, no child really ever grows up hearing or asking for numbers. Um, instead, we only hear four words, tell me a story. And those four words are just deeply embedded into our human experience and really our software. And that will never change, but the power of numbers, the importance of data has been growing exponentially and becoming essential to how we understand larger narratives. Then I would argue that's not new. It's always been uh, true in Indian country. The use of statistics, counts, numbers have always been a part of how we tell stories. And you can think of Buffalo hide paintings as a great example of that from another century or pictographs recorded people uh, buffalo soldiers, villages, meteor storms, all that data was recorded. We did the same thing a generation ago with ledgers, books, computer tapes, and uh, even floppy disks not all that long ago, and CDs, thumb drives. Today, we carry more data capacity in our phone than we had in major offices and studios. And uh, what are we recording? Well, IBM once estimated that the content of all human history totaled some five exabytes or five billion gigabytes of information. Now we produce that many videos, pictures, and words every couple of days. And uh, numbers are very much a part of that. So we need numbers and we need more stories. And uh, I hope I can offer a little bit of both. Uh, let me start with Indian Country Today's story. We like to call ourselves a 40-year-old startup. It was founded 40 years ago as Lakota Times, a weekly newspaper by Tim Gallego. In 1992, he changed his paper's name to Indian Country Today to reflect its national coverage of issues and news. Then in 1988, he sold that paper to the Oneida Indian Nation, and they published it for the next few decades. On September 4th, uh, 2018, it announced it was going dark. Um, the paper was said to be no longer a strategic fit with Oneida Indian Nation. The media world had just changed so much. And um, they needed to have a different direction. So that went dark. One of the extraordinary things, and again, a number, is that during that period of time, 
uh, some 1,400 people a day looked at the blank website. 1,400 people a day went to see if there was something new and something they could um, cling to. And I think that shows how important news is to Native people. And the idea that we should have a national voice, I think, is essential. So in 2019, I was hired to bring it back to life. And uh, the Oneida Indian Nation donated Indian country today to the National Congress of American Indians. And uh, when the Oneida Nation decided to do that, they had a singular goal, and that was to somehow keep it alive. Uh, NCAI, I think their vision of it was it would be a newsletter in Washington, and it would report on things NCAI was doing. It would report on legislation. It would do be reporting um, in a really pretty much a small um, uh, enterprise. They shouldn't have hired me for that because that wasn't what I had in 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 mind. Uh, I, from the start, wanted an independent news organization that would try to cover the breadth of Indian country, uh, looking across really all of North America. We started with three people. There was a person, uh, two people from the old staff, Vincent Schilling and uh, Heather Donovan, who was a salesperson, and then myself. Pretty soon we added uh, a third person or in the newsroom, uh, Jordan Bennett Begay, our first employee. And then um, that was three years ago. In those three years, our growth has just been unbelievable. Um, we now have 24 people working across our news organization and uh, we're doing things that we just never expected. When we first went back to life, I wrote in a blog, it's easy to examine any news organization and see how things could be different. We think there are a hundred ways Indian Country Today could have made it as an enterprise. And that's just as true when I look at my own failed enterprises. And I have a checklist of those. And then I think if only, if only we had more money for creators, if only we had more funders, if only, never mind, there's always a list. Along the way, there will be failures, and along the way, there will be beautiful moments. Well, when I wrote those words, I had no idea that we would be involved with so many beautiful moments and how quickly they would come. So we like to call ICT1 as Tim Gallego. ICT2 is Oneida Indian Nation. ICT3 is when the National Congress of American Indians owned us. And then uh, just a couple of weeks ago, we started ICT4. On March 29th, NCAI transferred ownership of Indian Country Today to a new public, a nonprofit called Indig, Public Media for Indigenous, and uh, left really the future in our hands. Uh, we have made some. Um, our growth has been phenomenal as an NCAI under NCAI's ownership, and we hope to even do more so now that we're completely independent. Three years ago, when we started this uh, path, we decided that we were going to be about service, not profit. And what really does that mean? In the old media paradigm, media was really about scarcity. We grew up wanting to have scoops. We wanted to be first with the story. We wanted to cling to it. We wanted to hold on to it. And I don't think that works any longer. Um, I, I really learned this after the Seattle Post Intelligencer died where I'd worked as the editorial page editor. And I had a grant to write about healthcare reform. And I thought, I don't wanna freelance. I don't wanna be worried about the mechanics of it, pitching stories, sending out bills and all that kind of stuff. So what if I just give away everything I write? And um, I found immediately that people were using the material. I had an audience. And pretty soon people were paying me to give speeches and sort of thing. And I started thinking, wow, there might be a business model about free. And um, Indian Country Today kind of did that same model. Uh, all of our content is free. And um, one of the ways that works out is that tribal newspapers can use our content or tribal radio stations or even a website can use all of our content without cost. Um, we really like the idea that what we're doing is a public service. And so if we get credit for it, great. If we don't, that's also great. One of the other ideas we had was to create fellowships to bring people into our newsroom to spend time and ideally have them go back to their own tribal media. Um, we did a 
really fabulous uh, media fellowship, for example, with Polly Denikla, who was a reporter then at the Navajo Times, and she came back to uh, work with us in Washington, and then um, returned to the Navajo Times, and now she's gone on to work for um, Texas Monthly. We decided that one of the things that would really depend on our future, and this gets into the future of jobs and news organizations, is that we have the most powerful news mechanism ever created, and that's a mobile phone device. So we wanted to edit the product for the phone. We wanted to think about um, the phone as our primary vehicle of distribution. And this is a shift. Most news organizations start by building web pages, and then they figure out how to optimize that for the mobile. Uh, we didn't want to do that. We wanted to say the mobile is it for us, and everything else is um, on the side. Right now, just from mobile platform, we're reaching about 500,000 people a month with what we're producing. And really our goal is a consistent uh, to reach 1 million pages a month. Um, and I think we'll hit that within the next year. I have to say that not everything has been perfect. We've had surprises along the way. Uh, we still have more, far more stories to write than we have writers to pull them off. And I suppose that's always going to be true. I, I love hearing in our newsroom on a daily basis, someone saying, I need more reporters. And we really do wanna do that. I mentioned we've grown to about 24. I would love to see us double. I, I think we have a lot of missions in Indian country today, but one of them is to create a career path for young people and to show them that communicating to our own people is just as important as working at NBC or any of the New York Times or any of the other um, publications. Fact is, I want to raise a lot more money to pay more writers and uh, create an environment where we're paying fairly for both staff work and for freelance. We want people to write and tell their stories. Uh, right now we're in a building mode and the budget's limited, but I think in significant years as we grow and we're able to get more support from across the board, that's gonna change. And really the opportunities I think are unlimited. The driving force in all of this is readership. And um, I think we're building a significant readership. As I said, about 500,000 uh, readers a month. To give you an example of how that multiplies uh, over the course of six months, that's about 1.7 million. And we've actually had months where um, spikes have pushed us over a million page views for the month. Um, so reading us is really important. And, um, we hope what we're hoping for is for people to peek at us every day. We actually have a planned cycle where a reporter and editors will post stories at 6 a.m. Eastern, another one at 10 a.m., another one after two, and throughout the day. And then also to supplement that with uh, social media. And social media is a big part of that uh, story. Um, for example, on Facebook, really about half of our traffic comes back to us through Facebook, where people will look at it on Facebook, share it comment on it and send it around uh, that way. We're working on how we do uh, the story structure. Um, we also have, and this is really interesting, if you look at us on the website, uh, or on your phone actually, our number one demographic, and this is really rare for the media, but our number one demographic is 25 to 34. Uh, most of the people who look at us on the website are young. We also have a weekly newsletter that goes out by email. It's kind of the closest thing to the old newspaper, even though you know, we still call this a newspaper. Uh, the email goes out once a week. And what's interesting there is the demographics are just reversed. Uh, 55 to 64 is by far our number one uh, demographic on the email. So we're now posting at uh, at least one new op-ed every day. Um, I think this is something really cool is that really anybody in Indian country, and that includes everybody in this audience, has an opportunity to share their perspective on issues. Uh, all they have to do is send us a photograph and an essay at opinions at IndianCountryToday.com. Right now we're printing about one a day, but I see the point we're eventually doing uh, three or four op-eds a day. We did 500 plus op-eds last year. This is a great way for every native community to have a voice. We, in the New York Times or the Washington Post, they look at op-eds and they get really choosy and they may pick one. Uh, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna try to just to, to get them out as soon as we get them in and to get voices out. 
And I think that's a really important way for people to um, get information. I think there's this idea out there that people will not consume things that are long. And um, everyone in the media that I know has worked for years and years on trying to get stories shorter, 200, 300, 400 words. At speed of environment, you see people moving fast. Well, I'm here to tell you that our data shows that's not to be true. Uh, one of the most read stories we published last year was a historical piece by Suzanne Harjo. And it was titled, If You Don't Know Treaties and Sovereignty, You Don't Know History. Readership of that single piece, and again, most people read on their cell phones, um, topped 150,000, both from our piece and social media. And what's really cool is that people spent eight minutes and 12 seconds reading every one of the 5,400 words. Uh, we had similar um, results from several stories over the year, including one that also Suzanne wrote that was 13,000 words, a two century old whodunit. And the readership was just stunning. A few more stats on readership. Um, most people read our work on their mobile device, about 65%, about 5% read on a tablet of some kind and only about 30% read us on a personal computer. And in case you're interested, the number one device for reading us is the Apple iPhone, which is um, Apple products in general are high, but uh, just the iPhone itself is about 35% of our readers. I mentioned our young readership, uh, 25 to 34% is 25% of our readership. Next are 35 to 44, which is about 21%, and then 45 to 54 is 18%. Our readership is more female than male, about 60, 40, and uh, that's been consistent through our history. We're now owned by a new company that we just created called Indige Public Media, and Karen Michelle, who's Ho-Chunk, is our, new, our first company president. Um, this is the first time when ownership in a major news entity like this one has been aligned with their mission, and that is to be independent. And as a not-for-profit indigenous public media in Indian country today, uh, one of the means, that means we have to get support from individuals, from foundations, from tribes, from companies, really across all um, quarters. And I have a couple of cool stories there too. Um, even before we, we launched, readers donated more than $50,000 then we started to get in grants from foundations. And um, what I really like about that is it shows the broad depth of our interest. Um, our most recent fundraising drive last month, and we're gonna be like public radio, it's always gonna be, we need your support, we need your support. And it's true, we need your support. Uh, but one cool thing from our last fundraising drive was uh, more than 4,000 people donated under $100. And I think that is really showing that one, Indian country deeply cares about information, that they're willing to pay for information, people are willing to pay for information, and um, that it doesn't need to be from just people who have a lot of money, that people um, send $20, $15. And of course, it all adds up. This week, and I just love opening the mail because I get the one to get to see a lot of these uh, smaller donations. One last week, and I'm actually going to send it back because I was so touched by it was um, from a woman who said, I don't have very much to give, but I wanna send $5. And um, I just was really touched by that. Another one was from a prisoner. And he said, I have so much in my allocation, but I wanna make sure that I support your work because I read everything you guys do. And again, I really appreciate that and happy to send that. One of the areas where Indian country today already excels um, was our, and I just lost this my notes, <laughs> one of was our, um, that's funny, excuse me a second. One of the ways we excel was um, being able to have stories shared. And um, every time we talk about this, we have so many uh, new firsts. Um, just yesterday, uh, the Guardian newspaper uh, carried an Indian Country Today piece, and, and I should actually expound on this a little bit. So one of our first partnerships when we moved to Arizona, and I'll talk more about why we moved to Arizona, 
But one of the first things that happened when we got here was I wanted to hire a managing editor, uh, an, a Lakota woman by the name of Katie Oyon. And she had a career with Associated Press and it was going to be a tough ask because she really liked her career with AP. So I went and I said, well, what if we talk AP into just lending you for a year? And she liked that idea. And it turned out AP liked that idea. And she came to work for us for a year. And because of that, we have a really deep partnership with the Associated Press. And some of the ways that I think is really changing the narrative in Indian country is a lot of the stories that we write from our perspective, from very much the indigenous point of view, get picked up by the Associated Press and they're carried around the world. And I'll just tell you a couple examples that I think are really striking. Uh, one is, um, the stories we've been doing on, unfortunately, people who we've lost during the pandemic. We have a series called Portraits from the Pandemic that are really profiles of people. And the AP has picked up several of those, um, really expanding the audience. Just yesterday, a story um, on climate change in tribal communities was picked up by the AP and uh, was reprinted by the Guardian newspaper in London. So it really shows um, how significant uh, the work that our uh, journalists are doing. One of the stories that I'm really proud of is the way we've covered elections. There was a record number of Native American candidates for offices ranging from state legislatures uh, two years ago to governors, and then uh, more recently, a uh, number of people running for Congress. Uh, many of those stories would never have been told without Indian country today. In fact, um, Research that I started when I did my database has been cited by New York Times, uh, National Public Radio, The Economist. It really was a go-to for information because there was nothing else like that before. And um, so much so that Lieutenant Governor Peggy Flanagan, who's White Earth, said that there's no way she would have been elected had not uh, our reporting been out there and chronicling her story. And I think that's true of other politicians as well. She was very kind to admit that, but I think it's true. Uh, one, one of the cool stories, and this happened uh, three years ago, is um, one day out of the blue, I was looking for a way to highlight some of these issues. So I started using the hashtag she represents. And um, pretty soon I got a phone call from Bethany Yellowtail, the designer, and she designed shirts and used the name of every of the women who were running for office at that time on her shirts, which I think is really showing uh, a way to um, build on our what we were working on already. In 2018, we knew we were going to make history. We knew that um, there was a good chance. Well, we knew Deb Holland was going to get elected in Albuquerque, and we knew there was a really strong chance that Sharice David would get elected in Kansas. There was also a number of Native Americans on the ballot at legislative levels. And um, there were several candidates that year for Lieutenant Governor. So I thought, wouldn't it be cool if we could create a Native television network and cover the election? So people could tune into us instead of CNN. And instead of just candidates running across the country, there would be our candidates and we could ask them questions. So we decided to pull this off and I called up uh, First Nations Experience in Los Angeles, a television network, Native Voice One, and said, do you wanna be part of this? And they both immediately agreed. We talked uh, 40 some journalists into working for us and um, set out to produce a six hour broadcast wall-to-wall uh, -wall coverage on just Native candidates running for office. Uh, what, one way this was really cool so if you think about how a network covers something like this, they'd have big satellite trucks and two-way communication and it'd be going back and forth with um, telling the story. We knew we couldn't do that with a uh, satellite truck, but we wanted a way to have the candidates be interviewed and to be able to have uh, people back at the anchor desk say, hey, wait a minute, what about this? So what we came up with, we did the entire thing on mobile phones and so a reporter would have a mobile phone and they would show it like that and set up it on a tripod and they'd tell their story that way. But then we had a second mobile phone that we would tape behind their, on their shirt and use the earphones. And that would be the way we would have the two-way communication. So by using two cell phones, 
we were able to do the same thing that um, uh, a network could do with a satellite truck. I think the night experiment was really extraordinary. And um, in fact, the next morning I gathered the staff and I said, if anybody ever says they can't find anybody, uh, they should watch all six hours of programming because we have a whole list of people. And um, almost immediately folks said, now what can we do? And there was a thought, what would it take to create a daily TV show that replicated what we did on election night? Almost immediately, I started looking for a partner. Who could help us make this work? And I remember calling uh, Arizona State University. And uh, the dean at the time at the Cronkite School said, um, I don't think you could do a daily. I don't think you've got the resources. But I think you could do a weekly. And why don't you come here and do it? And we'll give you space for free. And so we started talking to folks. and. Um, Within really three months, we picked up and moved our offices from Washington, DC to Phoenix, Arizona and to Arizona State and started planning for a weekly television show. We did all kinds of planning. We did um, prototypes, we did little episodes, we did stories, we did things just to practice to see what it would take. Then the pandemic hit and um, we started doing Zoom calls with reporters just interviewing them about who they were talking to, what they were learning. Um, on another note, we did one of the most extraordinary things we did when the pandemic started was to build a database. I'm one of those odd reporters that will grab a spreadsheet as soon as I grab words. But we built a database looking at um, the infection rate and um, the mortality rate in Indian country. And nobody had else had done that at that point. The numbers grew so great that we actually had to turn that over recently to Johns Hopkins University, but we're still involved with that as kind of on a consultant basis. That initial Zoom call with reporters started to get audiences. We had them on Facebook, we did um, a variety of ways. And pretty soon FNX, our partner in television said, well, what if you did these as 2646 broadcast? And uh, we thought, well, and 2646 in public television land is a half hour. So we started doing a half hour um, broadcast. The first few months were all done in Patty Talahunkova's living, living room. They were very um, all Zoom, nothing fancy. We just basically told the story that day that we knew it. Pretty soon we realized this was gonna be an ongoing thing. So we rented out the Phoenix Indian School Visitor Center and created a temporary studio there. We worked to make sure that our crew was limited and always protected, whether it be with masks or other devices, and really came up with a way to build a um, set. Uh, just two months ago, or about a month ago now, we moved back into Arizona State University into the real studio, and we have a full set with our logo on it and lights, and it looks really great. Uh, since that experiment, we've now abandoned, well, I shouldn't say that. The idea of a weekly is now uh, very different than what we thought of uh, when we first moved to Arizona. Uh, now we have a daily show and it's carried statewide in New Mexico, statewide in Alaska, statewide in, in North Dakota, and also um, through the FNX network in Denver, Seattle, or sorry, Denver, Chicago, and New York City. We're also carried in Oklahoma on Rogers Public Television. And um, we thought we're not gonna reach everybody just because public television is really difficult to get a half hour every day. Although I think there should be a lot more uh, slots for native programming. Uh, so we decided to take the Friday show and re-edit it and make it a weekly version. And so Monday through Thursday, it's daily. It's exactly what we have for the daily, uh, what we know that day. And then we re-edit the Friday show on Thursday afternoon and send it out to public television stations as a weekly show. That is That version has already been picked up by uh, South Dakota Public TV, Wyoming Public TV, and we hope to announce uh, a new group of stations very shortly. The Daily Show is now carried in Australia over Australia's indigenous television. 
And we think a couple of others uh, will soon pick that up. So in the we just had our first year anniversary two weeks ago, and it's been really amazing. Every day the show gets a little stronger. Uh, what I hope for with that is that we keep expanding talent and hiring more reporters like we really need an Oklahoma Bureau, for example. And as we keep hiring talent and more opportunity and getting more stories on, we think the quality of the show will uh, continue to improve. And I'm really excited about that. We have an audacious goal, and that is to change the narrative of Indian country by doing news. I mean, so much of what we do is just telling the stories that we all know. And part of it, that is, if you think about news because it's so narrow, they only tell the negative stories. But because we're doing this every day, we have an opportunity to talk about success. We have an opportunity to talk about things that work as well as things that need uh, fixing. I think already we are building the largest news operation ever in Indian country. And um, I think of the stereotypes from uh, American Indians, Alaska Natives and the media. And um, we all know the stereotypes that come out of Hollywood or Washington. Changing that with a news program that reaches a million people or more every day has the chance to change the story by showing the beauty, the intelligence, and most important, the aspirations of Native people. In fact, if you look at study after study, the same thing pops up. And that's that one of Indian country's greatest challenges is our invisibility. Um, sure, some people can talk about a conflict or a casino, but what about other success stories? What about heroes? That's when you often get blank stares. Uh, one of the things that I really like about our newscast, and I do hope you take a, a chance to watch it, either on our platform or over on public TV, is instead of doing the breaks where they just have um, commercials, our breaks also include little factoids about native heroes. We'll have a story about uh, Elias Boudinot or um, Lucy Covington, who was a tribal leader that fought against termination. Those little vignettes will be in our newscast and um, something you won't see anywhere else. I think changing the story means that we need to really increase the velocity of what we're doing. We need to look for opportunity and to be able to bring Native people in as experts. Uh, one of the things I really like is we now have a segment on Wednesdays where on one Wednesday we have a Democrat and the following Wednesday we have a Republican who offer commentary. And you think about how many times you turn on MSNBC or Fox News or whatever news network you watch and you see experts, but how rare it is for those experts to be Native and even rare to have them talking about subjects that don't involve Indian country. And that's one of the strengths, I think, of the kind of news operation we're building is that we have may have folks who will go on and talk about Medicaid policy. We'll have folks that will go on and talk about infrastructure from the construction angle, and we'll do it in a really uh, substantive way. I have a um, whiteboard that I put out about um, Native people and, and quotes. And uh, one of the things I like is that uh, we have the opportunity to change the story. And that's one of our whiteboard quotes. This era that we're living in, all of this has come about because technology has changed the equation. Uh, it used to be five years ago, three years ago, we never could have started a television show based on the cost. It would have cost uh, several hundred thousand dollars to even open the door. And because of technology, a cell phone is a studio that you can carry in your pocket. We can do this um, just with our imagination. And I think that technology is really the key to not just what we're doing, but the types of jobs being created uh, for young people today. And that kind of leads me back to the numbers. One number that I think is really important is that um, thinking about the long-term, we have to think where the story interacts with numbers. And um, one of the ways that's true is um, young people and our demographic advantage. I mentioned early on that young people are the are primary readers for Indian country today. And I think that's really important because uh, not only are young people our future, but it's an advantage Indian country has over general populations. Uh, most populations across this country, whether it be white or really any other demographic group, 
uh, are a lot older. And our young people are ideally suited for the creation of new. And so we need to encourage that for young people and look for ways to build on that digital opportunity. Uh, one of those areas, and I'll just use this as a metaphor, and it fits with the title of this talk, is a million lines of code. And to me, um, that really hits how technology has changed. In 1971, a Unix computer had a couple hundred thousand lines of code. Today, the software for a car, for just an automobile, in fact, right now they're having a car shortage because of this, is 90 million li lines of code. That's a lot of jobs for people that have the right skills. And I think Generation Indigenous is perfect for that. Um, people today have grown up in this digital world and they see all the opportunity around them. Used to be in my generation, you had to move away to get a job in television or get a job doing anything with technology. That's no longer true. Um, now you can work wherever you want based, and the, the pandemic has actually made this more true, not less, based on your ideas and the power of your ability to manipulate digital information, to basically to tell stories. Of course, we all have stories to tell. And I think now more than ever, we have the opportunity to uh, do that. I look forward to answering questions and uh, thank you again for having me here today. Well, thank you so much. You know, Mark, it's really hard to believe that two years ago when we approached you about being a keynote speaker for the symposium, we thought what happened last April that you were, had two other staff members on hand. And then now you've grown so much to this incredible um, news station and, and paper, you know, medium to share information. Um, and there are a couple of things that you stuck out, and I'm going to invite the um, attendees to post their questions either in the chat or if you're watching via Facebook, you could uh, post them in the comment section and, and we'll bring those up here live. But I just had a few thoughts as you were as you were talking. And one is that you talked a lot about young people and engaging young people in this process and, and with Indian Country Today and, and with technology. And we kicked off this year's symposium actually with a conversation about creating pathways for success for our young people, for our graduates here at NSU with our local tribes. And, um, you know, you talked about fellowships and, and that was something that we discussed as well. How can we develop these uh, pathways for internships, for job shadowing opportunities so that they can get that experience that they need in order to land that job once they graduate. And so I'm so happy to to hear that uh, you and I are both on the same page in that regard. And, and maybe we can develop that partnership to help make some of that happen for our media studies students here at NSU. I'd love um, to do that. And I should say that um, universities have been a key part of our enterprise. Uh, we're, of course, we're based at Arizona State University and it's been just a fabulous partnership. My office, in fact, is at ASU. Uh, but when um, we wanted to expand into Anchorage, I thought, well, let's take that ASU idea and see if another university is interested. So we actually have office space at Alaska Pacific University modeled after ASU, and they were very gracious, and we have an office there based on that. I'd love mm -hmm. to do that elsewhere. I think it's just a great way. One, we have as part of our agreement with Arizona State is to hire interns, and I was thinking, that's not a burden. That's an opportunity. I love that. And so <laughs> instead of rent, we hire interns. And I would love to see that be um, uh, more commonplace everywhere. Absolutely. We, we need to have a follow-up conversation on that. Um, you mentioned you need an Oklahoma Bureau. Maybe we could be your, your central location here in, in Tahlequah, Indian country. Um, there is a question about partnerships with Cherokee Nations, uh, OCO uh, Weekly Station. Are you familiar with the stories that they put out there? I am, and I'd be happy to talk to them about a partnership. We, we have a couple things that fit. Um, so really it'd be them giving us content because um, all of our content, we again, I mentioned service is our mission. Uh, all of our content can be used for free. So whether it's a tribal newspaper or a tribal radio station or television, if they see something they're interested in using, we say use it. So absolutely. Mm -hmm. Awesome. And the, the next question we have, uh, the younger culture often heavily follows arts for community development. Do you have a, a development team working in this area? 
I think instead of a development team, we have young people. <laughs> we have a, a really great story, and I've learned more about TikTok than I ever thought I would. Uh, we have a story just yesterday on a Nupiat woman on TikTok. And um, we got this because one of our reporters is clued into what that is and uh, does a great job. One really cool thing coming up later this week is uh, one of our reporters is actually going to be able to ask a question at the White House. And um, and what I really like about this reporter is that um, she came right out of school. When I first got into journalism, a big news organization like ours would tell people, well, you got to work somewhere else first. You can't just come right here. And I think that's crazy. Why not just say, come bring everything you've got and we'll take you now and learn from you as you learn from us. And so we hire people straight out of college. It's good, good to know. There's another um, question about how can indigenous youth and community learn to practice and uh, contribute to these media sources? You had mentioned writing articles, op-eds, reporting, et cetera. How can they contribute uh, to these sources? That's the question. Sure. Um, our op-eds are wide open. And basically, if someone wants to write it, we'll take a look at it and probably post it. And it would just go to opinions at IndianCountryToday.com. And uh, we publish about seven a week. And I would like to see that double or triple in the next year or two. Because um, I think, I mean, when you're talking about 540 plus tribes, the opportunity to get lots of ideas out there is unlimited. Absolutely. Uh, there is a, another comment about, uh, someone said, on behalf of my daughter who's teaching code to her second graders, do you have something that can address this uh, to this demographic? So maybe the educators out there who are teaching that younger generation coming forward uh, when coding or, or other areas of technology. Yeah, I don't think anything specific, but I would love to figure out what might work. I mean, I love the idea that someone in second grade is writing code. I mean, that is really powerful because um, that's really how you change things. There are a number of really great coding operations out there, ranging from language preservation to um, graphic novels. And um, the idea that you could expand that to future people. And you never know who's gonna get hit by the bug and say, this is kind of fun. I like doing this. I could do this for a career. Absolutely. One of, one of the other things that you mentioned, Mark, was this importance of partnerships for you all and, and this service to the community. And uh, you mentioned that, you know, maybe free is a good business bot model, right? Because everybody's picking up your stories. And um, I think I can relate to that a lot in working in education and working in this role at the Center for Tribal Studies. And, you know, this event is a great example, right? Like it's a full week long conference that's free and open to the public. And we don't ever want to have to change that, that piece, right? We want to continue to bring um, well-known scholars like yourself and um, people working out there in Indian country uh, to our community here in Tahlequah. And now we're able to broadcast all over the country and the world. Whoever wants to pick up on this this year can, can watch that. And we're able to do that because of those partnerships and, you know, through grant writing. And so, I just, I just want to thank you because I know that that requires a lot of extra work go into that. And that also means that you probably aren't even paid as much as you, you could be paid if you worked for a for-profit entity. But I think that that speaks to the commitment to Indian country um, and to the sense of community and, and what we know, you know, as an indigenous people and, and who we are and how we operate. Um, and I, and I want to thank you for elevating the voice of Indian country and for making sure that our stories are being told, whether that's the stories of politics, the stories um, as it relates, relates to healthcare, those heroes um, and vignettes that you mentioned that you're weaving into the um, conversations. I, I think that those things are so important for our non-Native communities to understand who we are um, and that we are still here. We're thriving. Um, and that we're not some uh, people of the past, right? Like we're, we're here today. Um, and so I, I just want to say thank you. Thank you for that. Um, and that you are a true, a true visionary of Indian country. You know, what you've done with Indian country today, I think speaks to that, but also all of the things that you mentioned in your talk today um, really, really demonstrate that. So you are a perfect uh, keynote for this, for this symposium and great way to kick off our keynote presentations this week. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. If there aren't any um, other questions, I um, I think we can wrap it up. I'm going to check the Facebook feed. 
It looks like uh, I don't see any more coming through. Do you have any final comments that you'd like to leave us with, Mark? No, this is an exciting time. And um, I, I really, well, and, and this is one that I'll just ask as an ask. So how can you help us? One thing is, uh, next time you see a breaking news story, don't share the New York Times, don't share Washington Post, share Indian Country Today. Let's do it from inside. Absolutely, absolutely. I know I follow you guys on social media as well. So I think that is, um, I'm sure that you'll take donations and, and on all that as well, but if we can just commit to sharing the originator of those stories, then that will do a lot of good, right? Absolutely. And yes. our writers love it. And there's, they, they, it means so much to them. Great, great. Well, again, I want to thank you for your time. I